Okay, I guess uh, let's get started. So now we have uh, Daniel Ahman from the University of Tartu, who's going to talk about comodule representations of second order functionals. Again, we have half an hour and then 10 minutes question time. Please take it away. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a joint work with, with Andre from University of Ljubljana. And what we are trying to do here is to take the, like the classic story of representing uh, continuous second order functionals with certain kinds of well-founded trees and put a bit of kind of sprinkling of category theory, monads, co-modules on top of it so that we could have more kind of expose the structure of these constructions a bit more and then study them in, in a more um, a nicer setting than maybe just working with Turing machines or very low level details. So, oops. Uh, the plan for today is the following. So we're going to recall what are three representations of continuous functionals. We are going to look th at them at a cert uh, from a certain more abstract viewpoint, um, which will eventually will lead us to this notion of co-module representations. And then we will see that we can now uh, instantiate this general notion in various different ways and get um, out representations of all sorts of functionals with interesting properties, not just continuous ones, but we'll, we'll see uh, many others as well as, as, as are listed at the bottom of the slide. So let's start with <coughs> continuous functionals and their three, three representations. So for example, here's an example function, functional. It goes from um, a stream of natural numbers to natural numbers, um, with, and its definition is given um, here on the, on the right. And what continuity ought to mean intuitively and information theoretically is that if we want to compute a finite amount or a finite precision of our input uh, output, then we should only be looking at finite amount of um, information uh, in our input, right? So here it means that to compute a, a functional like this is continuous. Uh, if computing its value, we'll only look at its input uh, or its argument at a finite number of places. And this is the case here. Uh, we look at the argument h at index two, if you think of h as being a stream of natural numbers. And then we look at it uh, at the value at h2, uh, h2 times two. So it's if nothing is completely statically determined. They're gonna, the output will still depend and uh, will, will still be, be dependent on what the value of the h is, but we are only going to look at at most two places um, in, the, in the argument. And now a tree representation is just a way to make it explicit that uh, our functional is computing in such a way that it's looking at the argument um, a only a finite number of times. And here's an example of a tree representation. So um, the red nodes correspond to the questions or the way that we query our argument. Uh, the branching at each of the nodes is, uh, corresponds to the possible answers. And the blue leaves uh, correspond to the values of the functional. So it's also coded in the, in the coloring of the type now. And for example, if you would have, if the functional would go from uh, a stream of Booleans, then every node would have just a binary branching. But in this case, we have a natural number, uh, uh, many branches. And the way that you would use this kind of representation to compute the value of the functional is that we basically take our Example argument, for example, uh, we have a stream that consists of 1, 5, 0, 3, 9, and then so forth. Um, and we take our functional, and then we just trace a path through the through the tree. So we start at the root node, the question we, we query the argument at value two, so uh, or at, at, at index two, so it's gonna be zero, meaning that we take this branch, then we are at uh, uh, at this node, which is saying that, okay, the functional should uh, query uh, the argument at index zero next. Um, and the uh, argument's value at index zero is one. So we, we proceed here, and this is the blue uh, number at the leaf is now the value of our functional. So this is a way to take this definition and represent it as a tree. Um, and uh, one thing to note is that these representations are not unique. We can have duplicated queries, we have redundant queries, we can sort of, uh, do crazy things in the tree. Um, so in the following, we're not going to look for unique universal solutions that every, every function should have exactly one uh, canonical representation, but we're going to uh, capture a general story about when or kind of what does it mean to be a func uh, for a function to be representable in a certain way. And so this is sort of the very classic uh, story that goes 
uh, back to Brower, and there are slightly different versions of these trees, uh, which one can translate between. But uh, sort of this is this is the version of trees that we're gonna um, uh, build our uh, our ideas from. So yeah, so um, this is nice, but this is very concrete. So this is very tree based. Uh, we have kind of fairly concrete. Um, uh, types in our domains and codomains of the functionals and so on. So we would like a slightly more um, abstract story of this. So, um, so the way that we're going to do it is we are going to kind of combine a bit of category theory, a bit of type theory, containers will make an appearance. Um, and first of all, we're going to define inductively um, a type or a set of trees. And what should be noted here is that for most of the talk, I'm going to pretend that the universe of types is also going to be a category. Uh, um, but you could tell the whole story just in category theory, just in type theory. So they're going to be somewhere in between. So we're going to have this inductively defined set or, or type of trees, uh, which are node labeled. Uh, so for a given um, uh, type A and the type family P, uh, the nodes are labeled by A's. And uh, then we have PA many immediate subtrees. And then we have leaves. But one thing to bear in mind here is that the uh, the leaves in these trees are going to be unlabeled. So compared to what we saw before, uh, now from now on, we're going to work with unlabeled uh, leaves, and we're going to package the leaf labeling into a slightly different structure that is going to play out nicely uh, from a category theoretical point of view. And in order to talk about what, what are we going to put into the leaves, we're also going to define a type of paths. So these are paths from the root of a tree to all the possible leaves. Uh, and they're just basically steps choosing uh, branchings at each of the nodes until we get to a leaf and then we stop. So another observation that we can make is that if we are given um, a pi type like this, so a dependent product, uh, and we're given a tree, then we can easily recursively compute the path through this tree T just by saying that, well, if we're at the leaf, we stop. If we're at the node, then we consult this argument H to know which path we're going to take, and then we recursively continue uh, calculating the rest of the path. Sorry, can, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, yes. In the in the previous slide, uh, if I think like a category theorist, what are we saying? Are we saying something? Say the type is set for me, uh, and so what is the type of trees? Is it just a factor from n to set? Uh, like from, so, from, in a category theoretic perspective, what is so the type it, of trees? I mean, the type of trees is is a particular um, W type. Okay, that's enough. Thank so, you. Yeah. So this is this is uh, both of them are particular kinds of W types. Just the path is for index W types over a pre-shift category. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, and in, in if you put this all together, then uh, um, this. CAP is going to be a map that goes from the, the dependent products to like a path forming operation. So it give, gets a tree and then carves out the path in it based on based on this argument. And we'll see why this is important in uh, in a slide or two time. So um, now um, using what we saw in the two previous pages, so trees, paths, and this uh, C map we can uh, cast the tree representations in a slightly more abstract way. But before we do that, uh, we're also going to generalize the forms of functionals that we consider. So it's not going to be just nat to nat to nat, but we're going to allow uh, general dependent products in the domains and the general dependent products in the codomains. This is this is nice because then we can also have a compositional story and have a category of these um, representable functionals uh, afterwards. So now, if we have a function of this form, then to uh, for it to have a tree representation, uh, means the following things. So first of all, we should have two maps. So we have a map T and then we have a map E. So the T is saying that, so for every instance of output, so for every little b here, we are going to compute uh, a tree uh, whose nodes are labeled in A's and the branching is given by P's. And this is telling us, okay, so for uh, any little b that we want to get an output uh, for, we are calculating a particular tree that describes how we're going to query the uh, um, argument of the functional. And then we have a second map, this E, which is saying that, well, for now, a path, or for any path in this tree that we calculate, we are going to say, okay, what is the value in QB? 
So this is the role of uh, of the blue leaves that we had before, but now we have just packaged it into a um, into a separate map. So it's uh, the, these values are not part of the tree, but we have a separate labeling map. And then um, for this data to really represent the functional, we require oops, uh, uh, the following diagram to commute. And what it's saying is kind of intuitively is, is written all the way down here is that, so if we go on to compute F applied to H applied to B, the value, which will be in Q of B, then what we do is we, first of all, use the T map to uh, construct um, the tree that is representing how F computes for uh, a given little B. We use this CA B map uh, to turn, uh, to calculate a particular path through that tree based on the answers that the, the argument H uh, of this functional gives. And finally, we use this E map to now just uh, label that leaf with output value. And this is the value of the function. And we'll see in a few slides time that even though we have kind of a uh, multiple nested lambdas here, and it might look all compl very complicated uh, in, in a more even in an even more abstract uh, way of looking at it, things will become actually uh, much uh, quite quite a bit nicer. But yeah, this, so this is this is the idea that we have a functional where we have um, the representation means that we have a bunch of trees given by this TF map, and then for every leaf in such trees, we we have a way to um, assign a value in Q of P to them. And then um, for computing the value of F, we would yeah follow exactly like we had before. Uh, which is we compose these things together. So now um, this is nice, but there's still a lot of kind of noise here. We have some dependent products, we have trees and paths. So we would like to uh, package it up even more abstractly so that we would have kind of nicer axiomatization of the structure, what, this represent, what these representations mean, uh, so that we could start playing around with uh, maybe uh, altering some of that structure to get different kinds of uh, representations or represent representations of different kinds of functions. Uh, and yeah, what I, what I didn't say maybe uh, outright is the overall idea is that this functional f itself could do crazy things, but the, rep the representable ones are now the ones that will behave um, nicely in a certain way. So here they are only looking at finite number of, of inputs, but we'll see other examples where this nice nice behavior means uh, something slightly different. So yeah, so can we capture this kind of diagram and the data in it more abstractly? And the answer is yes. So uh, just to recall, um, in type theory, uh, but also yeah, more in category theory, we have this notion of containers or um, polynomials in one variable, which consists of um, a type or a, or a set or an object of shapes, and then a family of positions. And the original motivation for them, at least from the computer science perspective, was that you could use these to um, represent or encode uh, parametric data types. So the shapes really describe the shape of the data. For example, uh, if you want to represent lists, then the shapes are the lengths of the lists, and then the positions are just uh, these placeholders where we could map the data into. So uh, a list of length n will have uh, n positions in it, so n places where we could put data in it. And trees are similar, um, like we had, uh, well, the kinds of trees that we had before, where the shapes would be like the node level trees, uh, sorry, yeah, node, node level trees, and the paths would be um, these paths, or the positions would be the paths from the root to the leaves. So from the, from the uh, storing data perspective, the, the data would be stored at the leaves. Um, containers also come with morphisms between them. Um, we're not going to go too much into the detail, but uh, the idea is that, well, as you would expect, there is a component of the morphism. It goes uh, is between shapes, and the component of the morphism is between positions. Uh, but one thing to bear in mind is that whilst the shape map is going in the forward direction, where we go from container A P to container B Q, the shape map is going from A to B. Then the position map is going in the opposite direction. So we're going to uh, from the positions of the co-domain container to the positions of the domain container. And again, when uh, in the original motivation uh, for using container morphisms for um, uh, representing well, polymorphic functions, the idea was that, so the position map is encoding the fact that if I have a polymorphic function, then any data in the output has to be coming from somewhere in the input. So it's saying that any, uh, it's saying where, um, the data in the output placeholders is coming in terms of the placeholders in the input. And containers form a very nice category. It has a uh, 
a wealth of structure in it. We're not going to discuss uh, that uh, today, but it's it's a very nice place to, to work in, uh, as many people have, have discovered. Uh, but we are, what we are going to look at is this notion of co-interpretation of, uh, of containers. Uh, so uh, maybe before even going to that, I should uh, mention that sort of containers have a usual notion of interpretation in terms of polynomial functors. But here we're going to look at a, a slightly uh, different dual notion where uh, given a container, AP, um, on objects, it's going to get mapped to this dependent product. Right? We have dependent product over the shapes. Um, um, uh, and then uh, of, of the positions. And then on morphisms, it does uh, kind of what you would expect. It it, uh, um, it goes from one dependent product to another using the Fs and Gs to move um, with the arguments and uh, results uh, in in both directions because of the contravariance of the byte type. And as we'll see later, uh, this nested uh, lambda uh, abstraction here is also very similar to what was on, on our triangle. Um, so once we have kind of this observation um, in place that uh, objects of this form are actually the result of applying a, a certain nicely behaving functor to containers. And uh, when we apply this functor to container morphisms, the maps are of this form, then we can rewrite our uh, triangle in a slightly more abstract way. So the representation of uh, F now means that there are still these two maps, T and uh, E, but we can abstract away these pi types and say that, well, we have um, some functor, or in this case, this uh, angle brackets functor uh, applied to uh, each of the three objects. Uh, at each of the three objects, we have the angle brackets functor applied to containers. And in particular, this uh, bottom to top diagonal morphism is, you can see it more abstractly as uh, this co-interpretation angle brackets functor applied to a container morphism uh, T. So this is making life already slightly more um, nicer. So the next thing to observe is that um, we would also like to abstract away from what, it, what are these trees and paths here? Can we can we say what is the more abstract structure that uh, it's it's an instance of that we could vary later on? And there, the observation here is that uh, these um, trees where or this, these containers where the tree shapes are these node label trees and the positions are the paths actually form a monad on containers where the unit is just taking an A and turning it into a singleton tree. And then on the position side, uh, it's just taking the, the single step possible and giving you a position. So more graphically, uh, you can see the unit as operating like this. So on the shape side, it takes an A and takes it into a singleton tree. And then the position side, it takes any of the possible um, paths, which are just these single links to leaves, P's, and just returns them as P's. And then on um, uh, the multiplication of the, of the monad is also working in a very kind of expected way. So if we have a tree of trees where this big uh, ellipse is um, the root node of the outer tree, which it, itself includes uh, one of these trees, then uh, the multiplication sort of fattens the picture and carves um, respective subtrees into the leaves of this inner tree. So, um, and then continues recursively until, until it reaches the leaves, which it, it doesn't touch. And why this is nice is that, uh, whereas here in containers, these node label trees work, then if you would work, just oh, work just, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. like in, if you would just work in set, then of course node label trees don't give you uh, a monad. But in the case of containers, we have enough type dependency, enough dependency around that uh, that we can force that uh, if you have a tree of trees, then both both of the layers are behaving in a nice way and they're connected as, as they should. And in terms of the path maps, which would be going the other way, is that if you have a composite math, uh, path in this uh, this big tree, then we just start walking from the root until we get to uh, one of the leaves of the of the root tree here, uh, we record uh, that path and then we keep going. So kind of everything works out very nicely. And more abstractly, um, you could also see this TAP, so the object of uh, object part of this uh, monad, as being the least fixed point uh, or initial algebra for a um, list-like end of functor, but using the structure and the category of containers. So identity, identity containers, co-products of containers, composition of containers. 
So once we have this in place, then we can kind of rewrite our diagram, uh, what it means to be uh, representing a function even more abstractly. So where we, whereas before we had these trees and paths here, which are very concrete, then we can just say that, oh, actually in this middle node, we have a uh, monad, in this case, the tree monad applied to the domain uh, container, the functional. And now the only thing left to ask here is, okay, what is the CAP? A map. Uh, could we understand uh, that uh, in a more general sense as well, so that we could later maybe vary it or play around with it uh, in, with different definitions? And the answer there is, is that uh, we can define this notion of a right T co-module for, for a monad. So it, it consists of a carrier functor, as you would expect. It consists of a structure map uh, such that you know, the uh, expected laws would hold. So it has to behave nicely with respect to the unit. It has to uh, behave nicely with respect, with respect to the multiplication. And because the the structure, uh, the tech carrier is a contravariant functor, then the directions of the etas, well, the maps include, involving etas and mu's, uh, change direction. And in particular, if we would take our co-interpretation functor, so these angle brackets, if we take the tree monad, and if we take the the c as we defined it before in a recursive way then this is an example of this notion of right t module uh, for a monad. Uh, and just to maybe note that uh, whilst you would think that maybe more monads go more together with modules, then uh, that is indeed the natural thing. Uh, and our notion of uh, monad co-modules is related to monad modules in the expected way. So our category of t co-modules is the category of t modules in the opposite category and everything up. So this is similar to as you would do with uh, uh, models and co-models of algebraic theories, you know, similar structures. So now we know what uh, what this C map also is in the abstract sense. So we can formulate the the, the general um, uh, definition of what it means for a functional to be uh, co-module representable, and then the, it's it's just directly generalizing what we had before. So we are we have a functional uh, between these pi types. We say that it is representable if there is a container morphism uh, of this form. So it's a morphism in the Gleisler category for uh, a given monad T. So this T doesn't have to be a tree monad anymore. We can later on instantiate it with any monad that we want or that will work for our purposes. Um, and yeah, so before this was uh, going to the tree monad, now it goes more abstractly into the monad that we are um, parameterizing our representation notion with such that this diagram commutes. And this is just a variant uh, or the more abstract uh, version of what we had before. So instead of the tree monad, we have now some monad T, uh, we still have the co-module, uh, we still have the co-interpretation of this container map. So this is now um, the, the tree representations um, abstracted away uh, uh, into the language of, um, uh, of uh, monads, their co-modules, containers, and the co-interpretation of, of containers. And now we are at the point where we are we don't we are not looking at you know, very particular things like just very concrete pi types or a very concrete monad of trees and paths. Uh, so we can look for other examples, and in particular we can look at them by varying what the monad is, what the co-module is, and sometimes we even vary what exactly is the definition of these angle brackets. So if we, look at, we can look at variations of the, of the co-interpretation as well. And then in the rest of the talk, we're gonna go through some of these examples. And yeah, okay, so, and these representable functionals form a category. There is a full functor from these uh, kind of representations. So the Gleisley maps in quant t to the representable func uh, functionals. Um, and the category also has um, some amount of nice structure, but I'm not going to go uh, too much into that. So let's instead look at what other examples uh, could be could be captured uh, in this way by varying either the monad, the co-module, um, or other structure that's in the picture. So first of all, we could take one of the very trivial options. We could take the identity monad on containers and uh, and the identity co-module, which also doesn't do anything, and then say that if a functional would fit into the uh, triangle that we had before, what does it mean uh, for the functional? And the answer is that um, a functional is going to be representable in this way if it's given by um, these two maps. 
And the idea now is that these are what we are calling uh, functional functionals. So these are functionals that will query their input um, on at most uh, one um, instance. So um, for every B, uh, the F is going to query uh, this argument here on only one of the A's, which is determined by this T map. And then based on what, down, what the answer it got, uh, the E map is going to tell uh, what is the actual output value of the function. So these are, um, yeah, the, these these are the functions that do do exactly this. And then we could kind of uh, vary this picture a bit. So if we would replace the identity monad with the exception monad or the lifting monad, then we would have an, also the option that where the representation would say that hey, on this little b, you are not allowed to uh, query the argument at all. So you have to give like a default answer there. So we get uh, more flexibility this way that the, the representations can, could tell that the function is not even allowed to look at the argument whilst um, at this level, even if the representation uh, is saying, okay, you can you can query a particular A, then of course the functional could also just give a default answer. It's not forced to actually use uh, uh, the argument that it, uh, well, the, the answer it got, uh, would get from, from looking at its, uh, its argument. Um, another nice example is the, if we uh, take for this monad T, uh, the following one where we are going to use the finite power set monad on the shape side, and then on the position side, we are just have a, uh, uh, a dependent product over the over over some finite subset of, of A's, and the co-module um, is just defined as a, as a restriction. So if we do it like that, then a uh, function of this form is representable when it only uh, when its outcome only depends on a finite uh, number of queries to its input. So the representation is going to say for every little, little b here, uh, this is a finite set of, or here's a finite set of a's that you're allowed to query uh, your argument on. And now based on uh, the answers that you get from your argument, uh, this is the way that you're going to uh, compute the little uh, the output in q of p. And one thing to note here is that this is kind of like a vari variation of the, uh, the tree-based uh, representations that we had before, where uh, now the set of queries only really depends on B. There is no back and forward. So with the tree, you could have the, if I, if I ask a question, if I get an answer, then I might ask different kinds of questions afterwards. Whilst here, uh, given a little B, you're going to get uh, all the questions that you can ask in one go, and also for computing the output, you're going to get all the uh, uh, answers that you can use in one go. So this is similar to, say, truth table reductions uh, in computability theory. Um, we can um, look at a little variation where instead of containers, as we had them before, we're going to consider what you would call propositional containers. So the position families would be valued in the universe of propositions rather than universe of types. And then we can look at the implications of this form. And of course, a general proof of this implication could do um, crazy and weird things, but particularly nice kinds of um, um, uh, implications of this form would be proved um, in, in, in much the similar way as we had before, or uh, which are called instance reduction. So for every B, uh, we uh, inhabit uh, some A, and then in such a way that from phi, of a, from, from phi of that A, we can prove psi of B. And as I said, so if we restrict our previous story to propositional containers, if we pick a monad that on the shape side uses inhabited power sets um, and on the position side, uh, basically um, the propositional predicate that a particular um, a predicate is true, then uh, we get um, this variant of, of instance reductions uh, out from our uh, notion of commodity representations. And yeah, so the representation is is now for this implication is um, you produce a inhabited power set of A's such that um, you have you from those you can prove uh, psi of B. And uh, and yeah, so um, this notion of uh, commodity representations that you get uh, uh, relates to uh, this notion of instance reducibilities uh, uh, in a com in a computability theory sense uh, in a nice way. And similarly, if we would take, uh, instead of taking the power set monad, we take the identity monad on propositional containers, then we get uh, like so-called functional instance reductions where we are actually given a functional uh, function from B's to A's such that uh, the implication again holds. 
So I'm running out of time, so I need to skip over these examples. Um, but the highlight is that we can get many of the kinds of examples as, as you just saw from uh, a general story where we have an existing monad M on types uh, and we uh, have a suitable uh, monad algebra structure notion on the universe of, uh, of wherever our positions are valued in. So uh, most of the examples that we saw are, are of this form, uh, uh, except for the trees, which uh, actually use the structure of, uh, of shapes and positions uh, more intricately. And in this way, we could uh, also take another kind of trivial monad, which is just uh, uh, the really trivial monad, maps every A into the terminal object, uh, in which case we could consider uh, two different kinds of representation of functionals. So if our positions, the, the algebra extension operation for positions is also trivial, then we get constant functionals because the, the leaf labeling uh, for, for the trees has to, or for the representations, uh, cannot use any information uh, from the input. And then if we take the uh, uh, dependent product for the algebra extension operation, then we get the notion of self-represented uh, function. So every function can also represent itself in this way. And uh, as a basically last example, um, just quickly, uh, we, could, we could also uh, consider a slightly different kind of viewpoint where um, instead of just um, interacting with the argument of the functional, um, the functional could also talk to some external environment or an external oracle. And this is, this is where what we can uh, uh, capture by taking, for example, the interactive input output monad um, for, uh, for the monad that we, for the monad on types that we build our monad on, on containers out of. And then uh, the, uh, the positions would be uh, traces through this, these uh, IO computations in a natural way. Uh, and in this way, yes, we, we represent sort of functional interactive functional. So the functional capital F could talk to the environment for a bit, and then it uh, uh, asks one query uh, from its argument. Uh, for this to work, uh, this is the place where we actually are changing our um, uh, notion of co-module carrier a bit. So instead of just the dependent product, we're going to start uh, acting with uh, functors on it. So in this case, it's the just a, it's a state monad that we add to it. Because when we do it like this, then uh, our functionals uh, will, will the, the domain and co-domain types are now of this form. So they, they have this, there is this notion of this functional being able to talk to an external environment. And in particular, the function, arbitrary functional could talk to the external environment in arbitrary ways, but the representable ones are, are the ones that have to go through this uh, IO monad uh, interface. They can't just discard or duplicate the state or, or roll it back in, in arbitrary ways. And then of course, we could also consider like a variant where um, we could ask more questions from the argument, not just one way, which is just going to be a, a natural combination of, uh, of this uh, IO ideas and, uh, and the tree monad that we had before. Um, and in particular, these kinds of examples more abstractly uh, rely on the fact that the co-modules that we saw before, we can define them parametrically or polymorphically uh, in these functors S that are now appearing in the co-interpretations um, and in particular being able to lift co-modules to certain co-products of monads. So um, that's pretty much from me. So hopefully you got um, some uh, ideas. Hopefully it, it's, it's interesting. Um, and yeah, the idea is, is that now we have this more general framework where we can talk about uh, representing certain kinds of functionals uh, just by using the language of, of category theory, by combining monads, co-modules, containers, co-interpretation co of, of containers, and uh, by now uh, varying uh, this different structure, we can capture a lot of different uh, kinds of, of functionals with good properties. Uh, and the longer term goal is that we would like to use this sort of uh, um, framework to also study the uh, Turing reductions in all the glory, uh, but uh, from a more abstract perspective. So not operating with low-level Turing machines, but uh, trying to understand what is the more abstract, more categorical structure behind them. Uh, but that's it for me. So thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker.